Um, so this first poem is about a father who is worried his daughter is falling in love with some owls. It's called Owls in Law. These birds have no idea how to behave. Pouring glasses of water for just themselves. Regurgitating pellets of compressed bone. And now landing on my daughter's arms. As she laughs, their apertured eyelids click. When she asks which of them are single, their lighthouse smiles sweep the room. That night, I watched my daughter sleep. I'm at her bedside, there in the eaves. As she starts to dream, her eyes toil in their sockets. I warn the owls not to mistake this twitching for field mice and pluck them out. I know from research the power of their zygodactyl talons. Their wings are silent when they descend, claws now trimmed and tagged with commitment rings. Her eyes stay shut as they grip her clavicles, rising gently between rafters. They hide in a darkness to which my sight cannot adjust. I listen for her cries, but hear only deepening breath. So I'm going to read a, um, a Sestina now, I'm sure since you're all poetry buffs you know what Sestina is. It's um, a poem with six repeating words uh, that get repeated seven times throughout stanzas. I guess the only thing to really know is that it's incredibly difficult. Um, so it's called Sestina for my friends. I know what my friends are thinking because of the things they say. Joe, you are shiny and worthwhile and always thinking of others. I am not so great. I could name at least five people who are better Here's one of my faults. I'm forever calculating how to present myself in any given situation. Calculating people give W.G. Zebals rings of satin as a gift and think that the person receiving the book will think better of them. After reading it, they will say, Joe, it was beautiful. I mean, he's like the great gramps I never had. He even made supper compelling. I always give rings of satin as a gift, sometimes even to boys. Always is too much. I have given it twice if I'm calculating honestly. Once to a girl who thought I was great for just over a month until she suspected correctly that I think I am more interesting than her. <laughs> if I say that the boy I gave it to was better at football than me, then I think you understand. Better to be left for dead on the right wing, always knowing that the boy who embarrassed you, let's say his name is Luke, has this book in his bedroom. I'm calculating that he won't have sold it because he thinks, nay, hopes that one day he might read it. This great and clever book that was a gift from a friend who is not great at football, but by God, he's got a brain, and ultimately it's better to have enormous thoughts than to be almost semi-pro. <laughs> I think great people do not have these kinds of thoughts. I always keep my mauled copy somewhere half inconspicuous, calculating a spot where guests will see it, sure, but they will not say, I bet Joe put that there so I see it. <laughs> More likely they'll say, huh, such a clever book, just lying there next to his football boots. It is great to know someone like Joe, who is clever, but doesn't rub your face in it. Calculating people are the worst in existence. This poem is better for its honesty. Even when I admit all this stuff, my friends can always fall back from my honesty. He thinks too much, they think. We had best not say anything about that Cestina. He'll always be great to us, better than great. More like excellent. Well, this is what I'm calculating. <laughs> oh, 
So happy birthday, Carcamet. This is great to be part of this celebration. I'm going to read a poem from the book that Lauren mentioned, which is a wonderful book called The New York Poets. Uh, first of, I think, two of these series. Um, I'm going to be predictable and read a Frank O'Hara poem just because I think he's the poem poet who has probably influenced me most um, in the New York crowd. I'm going to read a poem that you probably know that he famously wrote uh, on the Staten Island Ferry on the way to a reading, on the way to a reading that Robert Lowell had organised and he saw on a newspaper that Lana Turner had, had fainted and so he wrote this really quick poem and then he read it at this very kind of proper sounding Robert Lowell uh, reading in Staten Island. I think part of the reason he wanted to do that is because he didn't like Robert Lowell so he wanted to show uh, disrespect which I found quite charming. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read it. Poem. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing but hailing hits you on the head hard so it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky and suddenly I see a headline. Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a few poems that I think, I guess, are poems of mine which are most inspired by that sort of voice. I've got a, a selection of these really short five-line poems in my book, I've got eight of them, and I think they're kind of notebook poems, they're very much, um, I guess they're, they're quite casual, but I'm going to read a set of them, so six, I'm going to just run them together into one. I decided to stop therapy because I was perfect. And how might your perfection appear to others? Classic, my therapist, missing the point completely. At 33, I finally had the dream where I made love to my mother. I kept saying, you are my mother, and she said, I absolutely am. Then she phoned my father and told him everything. Though the officer finds no bales of dope gathered to my lumber, the tender way he thumbs my waistband suggests he is seeking other lives that only my kind hips might diffuse the bar fights I see teeming in his eyes. How are you, co-worker? I feel the same, I yell, loud as a drawer of hotel cutlery. Exactly the same. My mouth so wide, they can't avoid my fillings made of grey amalgam, my feelings made of gold. Your lips are lovely, by which I mean love me, by which I mean babies, big ones. Let's have ones that laugh even though they can't walk. Let's have one a month. I think I'm finally ready. At last I am chosen for extended security. The man passes his wand across my groin. Wow, the wand says. Wow. <laughs> That's my soul, I explain as he pulls wide my buttocks, admires the tuft of cling film, a small pale flame. Okay, I'm going to read a poem called Dig. Um, this poem was inspired by speaking to a friend of mine who was uh, studying medicine and um, was in the middle of the dissection part of that course and was talking to me about where they get the bodies from, obviously the, the bodies are donated, but where those bodies specifically come from, are they local bodies, or have they come from elsewhere? Um, and she was saying, she was studying in Toronto, and in Toronto they get the bodies from the local community, um, which is not always the case. And 
and then we got to talking about why you would get a body from elsewhere, and it's to mitigate against the chance of knowing the person you might be dissecting. Um, so with that as my conceit, that's where this poem goes. It's called Dig. I saw Leonard once a month. No kissing, no nurse's uniform, just specific pain in a midtown loft. We had no safe word, but I knew to stop if he reached for his inhaler. He showed up at school as a whole body donor, looking mellow on a gurney, just slightly more unhealthy than when I last saw him alive. Our tutor plucked his liver, his clouded heart, the lungs shrunk to hollow milanese. When we moved to smaller blades, I raised my hand to volunteer. It was like old times, just deeper. How he kept that melanoma to himself, I'll never know. I shaved it with a filament and suction hose. We saved the head to the last, and Leonard would have said this was unimaginative, took the direct route in with mallet, chisel, sprayer. I was sad to see his tongue without its barbell, no ash on its tip, but I was back in the lounge of our suffering as I heard his eye teeth chip. Okay. So um, I think I'm just going to read two more. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to read, uh, these are kind of connected poems near the beginning of the book. I'm going to read them together. I wanted to see how unhappy I could get, and it was very. I did not know where I'd go to do it, somewhere not as beautiful. My life was hopeless when it was. I had the thinnest skin since sliced. Then God, in the shape of a young professional, paused her soft commute. And she did recommend a man who shut his eyes before he spoke. And he never let my jokes be jokes, never gave my pain a prize. And in time, I did step clear of his unaffordable home to kneel in a garden square that was open to non-residents just this one day of the year. And there I thought of other words for the little bitty sticks of grass that were not leaves or blades, in which I practice happiness. I love pigeons even when their claws are stumps and they walk as though in heels. I love guinea pigs for the idea they are in some way a pig. Their heartbeats make their bodies vibrate. I like to pretend to answer them. Who may I say is speaking? I love football. More people love football than love social justice, but that doesn't mean football isn't brilliant. Whenever I head the ball, I feel a poem evaporate. I hate the bit of the poem where you're obliged to hate something. I love the piano. I love true pride. I love the sun when it arrives like a tray of drinks. Thanks very much. Have a lovely time.